seat if you don't mind. And uh, we're going to get right into it, if you don't mind. 2 Chronicles chapter 10. 2 Chronicles chapter 10. And, uh, and I appreciate Brother Bell. Thank you for letting us come. And uh, then I, I always enjoy being with Brother Jenkins and enjoy him very, very much. And I always get about uh, uh, a dozen thoughts that uh, I don't have to study anymore. And uh, so it's good to uh, be here. We're going to get right into it, if you don't mind. Second Chronicles uh, chapter 10. And uh, if you'll go there. Uh, Brother Bell was talking about Dan's chin. And, uh, you know, God in the Bible puts different parts of the body uh, that, uh, you know, make up the body of the local New Testament church. Uh, you have eyes in the body, you have ears in the body, feet in the body. We hide those. Uh, and uh, I'm the chin of the body. And that's what I am. I was preaching on the different parts of the body in the series on Wednesday night. And we had a, uh, can you turn me up just a tad here? Uh, that We had a new family that had joined. And it's this old man on a cane. And uh, he comes walking up to me and he says, uh, Pastor, I know I just joined. This was my very first Wednesday night series that I've heard you teach. And I now know what part of the body I am. And he, I said, what's that? He said, I'm the foot because I'm going to kick you from here to the end of eternity to make sure you finish right. And I was like, praise God. And uh, so he came in the other day to see me. And, uh, and I said, look, are you here to kick me or encourage me? He said, no, you're doing good. I haven't had to kick you yet. So, uh, so anyway, so praise the Lord. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and, uh, and just get right into to my sermon. And I do want to go to 2 Chronicles now. I'm not going to rewind. Uh, my goal is not to rewind at any point and cover territory that I have covered. So if you miss it the first time around, you're going to have to buy the CD. And that's all there is to it. So let's get it done. Second Chronicles, let's all stand if you don't mind. Second Chronicles chapter 10 is where we're at. Second Chronicles chapter 10 and verse number 1. And uh, if you're there, say amen. amen. There you go. Second Chronicles chapter 10 and verse 1. And let me read it for you. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for to Shechem were all Israel come to make him king. And it came to pass when Jeroboam, do not, do not confuse the two, because they are two different people. And when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was in Egypt, whither he fled from the presence of Solomon, the king heard it, that Jeroboam returned out of Egypt, and they sent and called him. So Jeroboam and all Israel came and spake to Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now, therefore, ease thou somewhat the grievous servitude of thy father and his heavy yoke that he put upon us, and we will serve thee. And he said unto them, Come again unto me after three days. And the people departed. And King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men that had stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, saying, what counsel give ye me to return answer to this people? And they spake unto him, saying, if you underline this phrase, if thou be kind. Would you underline that? If thou be kind to this people and please them and speak good words to them, they will be thy servants. That little phrase, if thou be kind, I'm going to preach on this subject, a kinder kingdom a kinder kingdom. And I want you to listen very closely and I'm going to put the train on the track and we're just going to get it down the road and let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, it seems I agree with Brother Jenkins. I, I think that the theme, Lord, you've been working on our hearts and Lord, you've been working on our hearts to the point to where you have meant for the decisions we make inwardly uh, to truly come out in our treatment of other people. I have seen you do work in people's hearts this week, past couple of days. Lord, I ask you to do a work in my heart also. I thank you for what you have already done. I ask you to continue that work. Lord, may your word not return void. May we simply become that kind of ground that the seed can go into and it can yield fruit that will just explode in our lives. Lord, may the time we're done at church this week May people who meet us when we get back to normal routine, may they say about us, something happened to you this past week. Why are you different? May we praise you in front of them and let them know you touched our heart. Bless us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May be seated. Can you all hear me okay? Okay. When the men from the Bush family run for president, 
they portray themselves as more compassionate, more caring, and definitely gentler than sometimes their heartless and harsh fellow Republicans. It worked for George Bush the dad in 88. It worked for George Bush the son in 2000. And if Jeb Bush is smart, he'll do the same thing as he's running for president now. Bush 41, Bush 43, and probably Bush 45 have taken a page out of Ronald Reagan's book of leadership, and that is to have a strong position, but an even stronger disposition. People are tired of, rotten, of a rotten attitude and rotten politics. But something even smellier politically is when someone with the truth has a rotten attitude. If you want to incite a riot in any given venue, try enforcing the law with a terrible spirit, and you will find that people cannot cope with a condemning attitude when the law has already proven them to be in error. In the text, you have a classic example, please listen to this, of the changing of the guard that did not bring with it a changing of the attitude. King Solomon passed off the scene. His son Rehoboam now ascends the throne. A delegation led by Jeroboam has an audience with the new king. The purpose of this high-level meeting was to request of the new king Rehoboam in verse number four. Would you look at it? Thy father, 2 Chronicles 10, 4, thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore ease thou somewhat the grievous servitude of thy father and his heavy yoke that he put upon us, and we will serve thee. Look right up this way. Jeroboam was not asking for a total change in the way they did the work, but for the easing of the attitude toward the workers who did the work. He used the words, ease thou somewhat the grievous servitude and the heavy yoke. Again, he was not asking for no work. He was asking, would you change your attitude about the work you ask us to do? King Rehoboam asked for time to consider the request. And King Rehoboam then goes to the old men. The old men had a unique advantage point because they saw how Solomon reigned. The old men were looking back on the effects of Solomon's attitude about the people. And because the old men's vantage point, they, get, they gave this advice to the king in verse 7. Look at verse 7. And they spake unto him, saying, If thou be kind to this people, and please them, and speak good words to them, they will be thy servants. I must pause and say this. I appreciate the wisdom that the aged men brought to the table and how they responded. They did not qualify their answer. They did not explain the past treatment of the people. They just simply gave the formula for success. If thou be kind. Understand exactly what the aged men were telling the rookie king. They were not telling the rookie king to change his position, but to make sure his disposition was very kind. Unfortunately, we live in a day and time where people mistake a meek spirit for a weak spirit. Meekness is and has never been a sign of weakness. We must stand firm on what we believe to the point to where when truth is where, where truth becomes paramount, not the anger with which truth is extolled. Truth has always been an irritant to liberals. However, what liberals cannot handle is when truth tellers are angry in their spirit and unkind in their words. To hide behind truth and to cheer truth from a position of passion without crossing the line or forcing others to accept it is how truth was meant to be delivered to the hearer. Truth is the drum and the drummer. Truth is the gun and the soldier. Truth is the horse and the rider. Truth is the politician and the stump. There is only one who has the power to guide mankind into all truth, and that, according to John 16, 13, is the spirit of the living God. My job is to tell the truth with passion. My job is to tell the truth with conviction. 
My job is to put truth on the front line and then step back and let the author of that truth decide where that truth will land and what kind of change that truth will have in mankind. For me to step past and do the job of the Holy Spirit with truth is for me to use my emotion to make sure truth takes root. When the biggest thing that I can ever do is to be a proclaimer of the truth and then let the God of the truth take the truth and do the work of the truth in the life of the one he created. King Rehoboam had a chance to rally the citizens around truth if he would have simply changed one thing, his treatment of the servant. If thou be kind. Was the admonition from the aged men, if he did Success is his. If ignored, problems are assured. What would Rehoboam do? What would be his decision now as put before his bench the advice of the aged men? Here's what he did. Look at verse 8. Look at the first beginning words. But he forsook the counsel which the old men gave and took counsel with the young men that were brought up with him and stood before him. And he said unto them, What advice give ye that we may return answer to this people, which have spoken to me, saying, Aze somewhat the yoke that thy father did put upon us. And the young men that were brought up with him spake unto him, saying, Thou shalt answer the people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it somewhat lighter for us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins, for whereas my father put a heavy yoke upon you, I will put more to your yoke, and my father chastise you with whips, I, but I will chastise you with scorpions. I cannot think of any sadder beginning steps for a king in his kingdom on his journey than what Rehoboam said, what is said about Rehoboam in verse 8. But he forsook the counsel which the old men gave. What a sadder sight than to see a rookie king in his youth think that the way to treat people is to be unkind. And for a king to ever think that you get the most out of people by having a thicker whip and bigger scorpions, what unpleasant phrases and words that were used that would be the policy of his treatment of God's people. I will put more to your yokes. I will chastise you with scorpions. Compare the philosophy with that of the wise and older group of men who had just come off the tenure of a king who was mean. They simply said, if thou be kind. King Rehoboam made a conscious decision to follow the harsh advice of the young men and ignore the kinder advice of the old men. As you read, this is very important, about the choice King Rehoboam made, you should not be shocked at what happens at the end of the chapter. Look at verse 19. And Israel rebelled. They did not rebel against the house of Rehoboam. They did not rebel against the house of Solomon. They rebelled against the patriarch's house of David. They took their rebellion because of the unkind treatment and went all the way back to the premise of the movement that they were after God's heart that's what David represented. And they truly wanted nothing to do with their heritage because the present rookie king didn't know how to be kind. The reason it's so quiet this morning is because to preach this message to fundamentalists is such an oxymoron. To say the word kind in a fundamental meeting will tilt the heads and raise the ears like a high pitch would do to a dog. Can you use the word kind and still believe something? Can you use the word kinder kingdom and still get something done for the Lord? Always remember this, rebellion is a part of somebody's tool if pushed. 
And rebellion is self-preservation against tyranny. And when a person feels like that the king is more in love with the work than the workers, then people will feel unappreciated. People will feel like they're slaves. And people at some point will rebel. It may take one generation. It may take two generations. But we cannot continue the insanity of doing God's work with tyranny. We have four simple points. We're going to lunch. One, a kinder kingdom brings out the good in the good people. You see, in a kingdom, you'll always have rebellious people, but rebellious people pull that crutch out of you're unkind to me, thus I'm justified in my rebellion. But when you are kinder and you are kind in the kingdom, then all it does is squeeze the goodness out of the good and leaves the rebellious crowd with no crutch to lean on. You're mean and you're rebellious, sir, because you're not right with God. It had nothing to do with my treatment of you. And when I can elevate my life to being so kind that everybody stands on their own two feet, then it will take those with great desires and they will thrive. And it will take those with evil designs and they will destroy themselves. If you want to find out about a marriage, please don't ask the husband, ask the wife. If you want to find out about a home, please don't ask the parents, ask the children. If you want to find out about a church, do not go to the pastor's office, go to the pew. If you want to find out about the workplace, do not go to the CEO's office, go to the employee's lounge. And at those venues, you will then find out truly what kind of kingdom that somebody has. I tell you this right now. I want nothing to do with a kingdom that is unkind. I want nothing to do with a kingdom that cannot treat people with respect. And I'm not talking about respect to their face. I'm talking about respect no matter where the meeting takes place. Two, a kinder kingdom will make people enjoy the work. The reason there's no joy in our church is because there's no kindness in the back room. We have so professionalized the program that we can't even enjoy the mess ups because of the people. What would you rather have, a professional performance or people who just love the Lord and enjoy what they do? Can I live with inferior product of a special but see a dear lady cry as she enjoys singing? Do I really want a bus driver that I have made life so miserable on him that I cannot give him the leeway of making a mistake? Would I rather put up with a mistake and have a happy bus driver? Or am I so worried about my insurance premiums that I'm not willing to enjoy the work? I tell you this, if you have an unhappy singer and you've just had a bad service, if you have an unhappy pianist, you've just had a terrible special. If you have ushers who can't even enjoy what they do, then you, my friend, have a miserable church. I want to be a part of a kingdom that people enjoy what they do, although what they do may not match my perfection part of me, but I must enjoy imperfection so that I can enjoy the worker, so that I can help the worker do better at his job. When somebody does mess up, is my first response to chide them or is my first response to enjoy the mess up? When the PA man forgets to turn the PA on when I get up to close the service because I've switched from my Janet Jackson mic to the pulpit mic, and when it's not on, do I call him names or do I simply say, hey, if you turn the television set off and wake up back there, we could get on with the service. And to have him bring a television the next service and set it up on the thing 
only to be prepared for the next time the mic doesn't come on. Is it truly when the special walks out too early? And they have embarrassed me. Do I step up then and look at the special and say, you weren't supposed to walk out here till the last verse of the second song. Now you get back out that door and you try it again until we get it right. Or do I walk up and say, I wonder what the combined age of this group is because all timers has set in and you people don't even know what time to come out because you're so old. Do I get you canes next time they sing? The work must be done, but is the work worth losing the joy. So do we abandon the work? Absolutely not. We enjoy the workers as they do the best they can in the work. You see, church is a very unique band of believers. We are volunteers. D did we hear that? We are volunteers. And if a volunteer can't enjoy volunteering, then why would they keep coming? Third thing. Don't sacrifice the kingdom while being kind. The kingdom still has laws. This kingdom still has rules. The kingdom still has things we do. The kingdom still has, you can't do that because that's what the higher king said and you can't act that way. But can I tell you something? I'm not in an effort to be kinder and going to sacrifice my standards. I'm not going to sacrifice what I think is right. I'm not going to back up. A lot of people associate, well, if we're kinder, then we'll let Iran run us over. No, we get kinder and we look at Iran and tell them to drop dead with a smile. We don't change the kingdom just to be kinder. We smile while we uphold the standards of the kingdom. I don't believe drinking's right. I believe if you're in a chat room with someone who's not your wife, sir, you have the beginning steps of being immoral. Teenager, you're not right with your mama. Hey, we don't walk that way. It's, it's me going up to the hallway of one of our teenagers that has in his possession some bad music, and me saying, y you know what I, I think that you probably better do? What's that, Pastor? I think probably the best thing for you to do, because I know Pastor real well, I think the best thing for you to do is probably go turn that music into your daddy. Because as soon as Pastor finds out, he's so walking down that hallway. And he's going to tell you, Daddy. Now, I won't see Pastor for another five minutes. So I think you got time. Yes, Pastor. Thank you. You see, I will not and I refuse to compromise my kingdom just to be kinder. But I will be so kind that you cannot help but obey the rules of the kingdom. Because when you believe something, at our seminary and schools, when I have to dismiss somebody, I don't dismiss them in anger with the slamming of a door and the shouting and the raising of a voice. That's not how the kingdom works. The kingdom simply works this way, my dear friend, I'm so sorry, but you've exceeded the right to stay here. I love you. I'm glad you were here. You added to us while you were here. And I'm so sorry that you have to depart us and you have 24 hours to make it happen. How can I help you go home? Can, can I help you pack your bags? Can I help run you to Dallas? Can I take you to Houston? Can I run you to Monroe, Louisiana? Can I take you to El Dorado, Arkansas? Would you let me take you home? They don't get a bus ticket and put on a lonely bus to show up at a lonely doorstep. A kinder kingdom. Next. Don't expect people to join a kingdom that has a mean spirit. Who wants to fight this old wicked world in this condemning attitude only to come to a kingdom that's supposed to be about joy and love and peace and gentleness and goodness and temperance? 
We fight it all day in the world. There ought to be some place we can come that we can face kindness. But don't expect somebody to help you in the nursery when you're like, how come I can't get anybody to help me in the nursery? That's probably why. I don't understand why they don't know how to do this bus thing right. That's probably why you have nobody helping you. Well, I don't understand why they just can't get that part right and why nobody wants to be a part of this group. That's probably why. People are tired of the treatment. And all they want to do is love the Lord. Next. Boy, I feel like this is going over like a pork chop in a Jewish synagogue. <laughs> or a Michigan fan at Ohio State homecoming rally. I said, first of all, a kinder kingdom will bring out the good of the good people. I said, second of all, a kinder kingdom will make the people enjoy the work. Third of all, don't sacrifice the kingdom while being kind. Fourth of all, don't expect people to join a kingdom that has a mean spirit. Fifth of all, as I exit, stage left quickly. Don't think I'm liberal because I choose to be kind. Mammy Adams always went to a branch post office in her town because the postal employees were so friendly. She went there to buy stamps just before Christmas one year. And the lines were particularly long, and someone pointed out that there's no need to wait in line because there was a stamp machine in the lobby. I know, said Mammy, but the machine won't ask me about my arthritis. British statesman and financier Cecil Rhodes, whose fortune was used to endow the world's famous Rhodes Scholarship, was a stickler for correct dress, promptness, and he definitely wanted everybody to look good at his gatherings. A young man was invited to dine with Rhodes, but arrived by train late and had to go directly to the Rhodes home in his travel-stained clothes. Once there, he was very much embarrassed to find that the other guests had already assembled, and they were wearing full evening dresses and tuxes. He had just gotten off the train. After what seemed a long time as he stood there embarrassed and moments turned into awkward moments, which turned into long moments, all of a sudden, Rhodes himself appeared in a shabby, old, worn suit. Later, the young man learned after inquiring, I thought Mr. Rhodes dressed up for everything. I thought he was he demanded for the apparel to be just right. The servant said this. Mr. Rhodes was completely dressed to make his entrance into this gathering. As we were going down the checklist, we found out that you, sir, had not yet arrived. When Mr. Rhodes inquired why you were delayed, we told him that you had been on a train all day and that unfortunately you had not had time to change your clothes. Mr. Rhodes peeked out to see what you were wearing and to see just how disheveled you were. So Mr. Rhodes went back into his room and got the oldest suit he could get on and on purpose wrinkled it and on purpose dirtied it because he did not want you to feel out of place. Summer's mother was extraordinarily beautiful, beautiful woman. Unfortunately, she married an extraordinarily ugly man. When the family friend got the courage up to ask this beautiful woman, no offense, ma'am, but how could you marry such an ugly man? She replied with a smile, he never once hurt my feelings. You listen to me. You can say whatever you want to say. But if you're not a kinder husband, and you're not a kinder wife, and you're not a kinder preacher, 
and you're not a kinder person, then that could be why you have no friends and nobody wants to be around you. The kingdom doesn't change. Kingdom has rules. Kingdoms have boundaries. But you listen to me. Everybody ought to leave your presence and be happier and kinder. I am telling you that at the Longview Baptist Temple, I will have a kinder kingdom. Nobody hollers at the Longview Baptist Temple. Nobody works for me that berates anybody. If I hear anybody hollering, that's their last day on the job. If we cannot treat people with respect, then you don't need to be in this kingdom. That does not mean I'm very firm with my words. I am very firm with my words. I do not use the pulpit as a bully pulpit. And when I ask to see people and I have to deal with an issue, the words become heavy, but my spirit never becomes heavy. A kinder kingdom. The old men said, we've lived under the other. I'm telling you, these people will love you forever if you just be kind. God bless you.